This is section nine of newspaper articles by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newspaper articles by Mark Twain. Territorial Enterprise, September, eighteen sixty three. Territorial Enterprise, September fourth and fifth, eighteen sixty three. Bigler versus Tahoe. I hope some bird will catch this grub the next time he calls Lake Bigler by so disgustingly sick and silly a name as Lake Tahoe. I have removed the offensive word from his letter and substituted the old one, which at least has a Christian English twang about it, whether it is pretty or not. Of course, Indian names are more fitting than any others for our beautiful lakes and rivers which knew their race ages ago, perhaps in the morning of creation. But let us have none so repulsive to the ear as Tahoe, for the beautiful relic of fairyland forgotten and left asleep in the snowy Sierras when the little elves fled from their ancient haunts and quitted the earth. They say it means fallen leaf. Well, suppose it meant fallen devil or fallen angel, would that render its hideous, discordant syllables more endurable? Not if I know myself. I yearn for the scalp of the soft-shell crab, be he Injun or white man, who conceived of that spoony, slobbering, summer complaint of a name. Why, if I had a grudge against a half-price nigger, I wouldn't be mean enough to call him by such an epithet as that. Then— how am I to hear it applied to the enchanted mirror that the viewless spirits of the air make their toilets by, and hold my peace? Tahoe! It sounds as weak as soup for a sick infant. Tahoe! Be forgotten! I just saved my reputation that time. In conclusion, Grub, I mean to start to Lake Bigler myself, Monday morning, or somebody shall come to grief. Mark Twain. Territorial Enterprise, September 17, 1863. Letter from Mark Twain, San Francisco, September 13, 1863. Over the Mountains. Editors, Enterprise. The trip from Virginia to Carson by Messrs. Carpenter and Hoog Stage is a pleasant one, and from thence over the mountains by the Pioneer would be another, if there were less of it. But you naturally want an outside seat in the daytime, and you feel a good deal like riding inside when the cold night winds begin to blow. Yet if you commence your journey on the outside, you will find that you will be allowed to enjoy the desire I speak of unmolested from twilight to sunrise. An outside seat is preferable, though, day or night. All you want to do is to prepare for it thoroughly. You should sleep forty-eight hours in succession before starting, so that you may not have to do anything of that kind on the box. You should also take a heavy overcoat with you. I did neither. I left Carson feeling very miserable for want of sleep, and the voyage from there to Sacramento did not refresh me perceptibly. I took no overcoat, and I almost shivered the shirt off myself during that long night ride from Strawberry Valley to Folsom. Our driver was a very companionable man, though, and this was a happy circumstance for me, because, being drowsy and worn out, I would have gone to sleep and fallen overboard if he had not enlivened the dreary hours with his conversation. Whenever I stopped coughing, and went to nodding, he always watched me out of the corner of his eye until I got to pitching in his direction, and then he would stir me up and inquire if I were asleep. If I said no— and I was apt to do that. He always said, "'It was a bully good thing for me that I weren't, you know,' and then went on to relate cheerful anecdotes of people who had got to nodding by his side when he wasn't noticing, and had fallen off and broken their necks. He said he could see those fellows before him now, all jammed and bloody and quivering in death's agony. "'Glong! Damn that horse! He knows there's a parson and an old maid inside.' and that's what makes him cut up so. I've seen him act just so more than a thousand times." The driver always lent an additional charm to his conversation by mixing his horrors and his general information together in this way. "'Now,' said he, after urging his team at a furious speed down the grade for a while, 
plunging into deep bends in the road brimming with a thick darkness almost palpable to the touch, and darting out again and again on the verge of what instinct told me was a precipice. Now, I seen a poor cuss, but you're asleep again, you know, and you've rammed your head agin my side pocket and busted a bottle of nasty rotten medicine that I'm taking to the folks at the thirty-five mile house. Do you notice that flavor? Ain't it a ghastly old stench? The man that takes it down there don't live on anything else it's vittles and drink to him. Anybody that ain't used to him can't go a near him. He'd stun him. He'd suffocate him. His breath smells like a graveyard after an earthquake. You, Bob, I allowed to scalp that ordinary horse yet, if he keeps on this way. You see, he's been on the overland till about two weeks ago, and every stump he sees, he callates it's an injun. I was awake by this time, holding on with both hands and bouncing up and down just as I do when I ride a horseback. The driver took up the thread of his discourse and proceeded to soothe me again. As I was saying, I see a poor cuss tumble off along here one night. He was monstrous drowsy, and went to sleep when I took my eye off of him for a moment, and he fetched up again a boulder, and in a second there wasn't anything left of him but a promiscuous pile of hash. It was moonlight, and when I got down and looked at him he was quivering like jelly, and sort of moaning to himself like, and the bones of his legs was sticking out through his pantaloons every which way like that. Here the driver mixed his fingers up after the manner of a stack of muskets, and illuminated them with the ghostly light of his cigar. He warn't in misery long, though. In a minute and a half he was deader'n a smelt. Bob, I say I'll cut that horse's throat if he stays on this route another week. In this way the genial driver caused the long hours to pass sleeplessly away, and if he drew upon his imagination for his fearful histories, I shall be the last to blame him for it, because if they had taken a milder form I might have yielded to the dullness that oppressed me, and got my own bones smashed out of my side in such a way as to render me useless for ever after, unless, perhaps, some one chose to turn me to account as an uncommon sort of hat-rack. Mr. Billet is complimented by a stranger. Not a face in either stage was washed from the time we left Carson until we arrived in Sacramento. This will give you an idea of how deep the dust lay on those faces when we entered the latter town at eight o'clock on Monday morning. Mr. Billet, of Virginia, came in our coach, and brought his family with him. Mr. R. W. Billet, of the great Washoe Stock and Exchange Board of Highwaymen, and instead of turning his complexion to a dirty cream color, as it generally serves white folks, the dust changed it to the meanest possible shade of black. However, Billet isn't particularly white, anyhow, even under the most favorable circumstances. He stepped into an office near the railroad depot to write a note, and while he was at it, several lank, gawky, indolent immigrants, fresh from the plains, gathered around him. Missourians! Pikes! I can tell my brethren as far as I can see them. They seemed to admire Billet very much and the faster he wrote the higher their admiration rose in their faces, until it finally boiled over in words, and one of my countrymen ejaculated in his neighbor's ear, "'Dang it! But he writes mighty well for a nigger!' THE MENKEN, WRITTEN ESPECIALLY FOR GENTLEMEN When I arrived in San Francisco, I found there was no one in town. At least, there was nobody in town but the Menken or rather that no one was being talked about except that manly young female. I went to see her play, Mazepa, of course. They said she was dressed from head to foot in flesh-colored tights, but I had no opera-glass, and I couldn't see it, to use the language of the inelegant rabble. She appeared to me to have but one garment on, a thin, tight, white linen one, of unimportant dimensions. I forget the name of the article, but it is indispensable to infants of tender age. I suppose any young mother can tell you what it is, if you have the moral courage to ask the question. With the exception of this superfluous rag, the Menken dresses like the Greek slave, but some of her postures are not so modest as the suggestive attitude of the latter. She is a finely formed woman down to her knees 
if she could be herself that far and mrs h a perry the rest of the way she would pass for an unexceptional venus here every tongue sings the praises of her matchless grace her supple gestures her charming attitudes well possibly these tongues are right in the first act she rushes on the stage and goes caverting around after olinska she bends herself back like a bow she pitches head foremost at the atmosphere like a battering ram she works her arms and her legs and her whole body like a dancing jack her every movement is as quick as thought in a word without any apparent reason for it she carries on like a lunatic from the beginning of the act to the end of it at other times she wallops herself down on the stage and rolls over as does the sportive pack-mule after his burden is removed if this be grace then the menken is eminently graceful after a while they proceed to strip her and the high chief pole calls for the fiery untamed steed a subordinate pole brings in the fierce brute stirring him up occasionally to make him run away and then hanging to him like death to keep him from doing it the monster looks round pensively upon the brilliant audience in the theatre and seems very willing to stand still but a lot of those poles grab him and hold on to him so as to be prepared for him in case he changes his mind they are posted as to his fiery untamed nature you know and they give him no chance to get loose and eat up the orchestra they strap mazeppa on his back fore and aft and face uppermost and the horse goes cantering upstairs over the painted mountains through tinted clouds of theatrical mist in a brisk exciting way with the wretched victim he bears unconsciously digging her heels into his hams in the agony of her sufferings to make him go faster then a tempest of applause bursts forth and the curtain falls the fierce old circus horse carries his prisoner around through the back part of the theatre behind the scenery and although assailed at every step by the savage wolves of the desert he makes his way at last to his dear old home in tartary down by the footlights and beholds once more oh gods the familiar faces of the fiddlers in the orchestra the noble old steed is happy then but poor mazeppa is insensible ginned out by his trip as it were before the act closes however he is restored to consciousness and his doting old father the king of tartary and the next day without taking time to dress without even borrowing a shirt or stealing a fresh horse he starts off on the fiery untamed at the head of the tartar nation to exterminate the poles and carry off his own sweet olinska from the polish court he succeeds and the curtain falls upon a bloody combat in which the tartars are victorious mazeppa proved a great card for maguire here he put it on the boards in first-class style and crowded houses went crazy over it every night it was played but virginians will soon have an opportunity of seeing it themselves as the menken will go direct from our town there without stopping on the way the french spy was played last night and the night before and as this spy is a frisky frenchman and as dumb as an oyster miss menken's extravagant gesticulations do not seem so overdone in it as they do in mazeppa she don't talk well and as she goes on her shape and her acting the character of a fidgety dummy is peculiarly suited to her line of business she plays the spy without words with more feeling than she does mazeppa with them i am tired of writing now so you will get no news in this letter I have got a notebook full of interesting hieroglyphics, but I am afraid that by the time I am ready to write them out, I shall have forgotten what they mean. The lady who asked me to furnish her with the Lick House fashions shall have them shortly, or, if I ever get time, I will dish up those displayed at the great Pioneer Hall at Union Hall last Wednesday night. Mark Twain End of Section 9